Good evening and welcome to Poker Night Live, um, the award-winning show that brings you live poker. Tonight, as usual, we're going to be learning how to play Texas Hold'em. How do we do that? We're going to watch it being played live on the internet. We can watch real people playing real games with real cash. Now, to help us learn how to play, I've brought along an expert. Tonight, that's Nick Welthall. Hello. Good we, evening. We didn't come together. Can I just dispel... <laughs> <laughs> that illusion before we start. You did say you'd meet me here. I did say I'd meet you here. I also specified, <laughs> could you not talk to me during the breaks tonight? <laughs> Getting That's a little fine. bit too familiar. <laughs> no, we're going we're gonna to help your game, guys. We are going to help your game. And try. he is funny as well, so we can all have a laugh. We'll throw that in. We'll throw that in. <laughs> <laughs> That's free. That's all for the same ticket price. So. <laughs> Nick will be commentating on everything that we see. Now, if at any point you disagree with what he said or want some banter, that's fine. You can let us know. Um, if there's something that he said that you don't understand as well, do um, get in contact with us. How can you do that? Well, you can text. Here's the number. 84222. And do remember to put the word poker first and then your question. Or you can indeed email poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. And uh, when we go to a break and after you've watched the poker news, why don't you check us out on the web, www.pokernightlive.co.uk. And there's also some great top poker topics up on the forum as well. And uh, you can have a chat with the other players. Um, tonight as well, we can, I think we'll uh, touch on people's uh, home games as well and how you can oh, yeah. play. Because we, we don't watch that much Heads Up, do we, on here? And I think we are. No. Well, it's something that a lot of people do at home. So if you have any questions tonight about Heads Up and whether you're just playing at home with friends, uh, whether you're going camping and uh, you're just playing a quick game and you need to know how to. <laughs> I'm just throwing it out here. You've got locationally <laughs> specific. <laughs> specific. Whether you're going ice skating or where, wherever you want to play cards. <laughs> A sweeping Wherever the nation, I play, hear. Um, there's a lot of people that play um, just with a friend at home. Yes. And uh, now, if you're getting uh, a little bit confused on uh, how you do that, what the rules are when there's only two of you, or how you have to change your game to play with only two of you, do get in contact with us, and it can be a little yeah, theme of the we, evening. Yeah, we particularly like hearing from new players. If you're new to the game or new to the show, we'd love to hear from you. And I always say on these beginner shows, doesn't matter how basic the question is, don't worry about that. We're here to help you through, aren't we? And where do you like to play poker? Is it in a tent somewhere in the rain? Is it ice skating, like you said? On a plane? On the toilet. Let us know. <laughs> on the toilet. You can, with a wireless network. Yeah, yeah. you can. Uh, right, well, tonight we're going to be watching tournaments, multi-table tournaments and cash games as usual. Um, so, Nick, if you wouldn't mind taking us around the tables. Let's go around the tables, why don't we? That went well. I thought that went very well. <laughs> That is a ten dollar ten dollar tournament. Final stages of wow. dramatic conclusion of next one. Just one of the games on offer. Here's another one. This is a fifty cent one dollar cash game. Win enough to change your life. Not not very much, but you would change your life. It would be slightly better. And 25 cent, 50 cent cash, half the price. Same amount of fun. Oh, look, Benny Pump's on there as well. He was on the last one. So you can multi table. Yes, you can play more than one game. He likes to be known as Benny Pump and Dump, but he couldn't get it all in. That does make it harder to pump and dump. This is a multi table tournament, uh, which we'll be dipping into throughout the evening as well. There we are. Excellent. Well, All we kinds be, uh, of poker games, aren't there? Oh, there's, there's a few, isn't there? And we'll be showing you uh, how to play each one. It is all exactly the same type of poker, Texas Hold'em, because you do get various different ones, don't you? Have Omar, Stud, Draw. Yeah, we show Texas Hold'em because it's uh, the game that's basically taken over poker. Uh, about 90% of games on the internet are Hold'em games and I think about 80-90% of those are No Limit as well. Yeah, we do do, it is No Limit Texas Hold'em tonight. Now, Limit... It is the same game, but it is played slightly differently, isn't it? It's the same game differently. The <laughs> same game but differently. That's exactly what it is, yes. Excellent. <laughs> the same rules, but a different betting structure. No Limit does exactly what it says on the tin. We'll get into this during the show, but basically you can bet any amount of your chips at any one time. So any one time you can go broke, or any one time you can double the chips in front of you, and that makes it the most exciting version of poker. That's mm. why we bring it to you. 
Excellent. Well, we will be watching it all night tonight. And do bear with us if you haven't um, watched the game before. Um, don't worry, we will be explaining everything. Um, so stick with us. Right, what should we start with? The multi-table tournament? Whatever you like, Michelle. Yes, let's head over there and have a quick look. We're going to be watching this throughout the night. And we'll be uh, watching the final table as well at the end of the night. Pump and dump. No, he's not there. He's not there. He's gone. He's gone. He's gone. Something to bear in mind. Um, right, OK, now, just so you know, there's 120 runners. 120 entrants into this multi-table tournament. So even though there's obviously only 10 people on this table, Excuse me, there is 120 people all together, so about, I don't know, 15 tables. Um, the total prize pool uh, is $1,200, and the top 10 places are paid. And now it is a multi-table tournament, so as people are knocked out, the tables are condensed. And uh, so you, do, you can be moved at any t time when you're playing in a multi-table tournament. Um, just they so keep all the tables even. Yeah, and, you know, it's just the breaks of poker. Sometimes you'll end up at a good table, sometimes at a bad table. And people that get upset about, say, being at a table where all the stacks are, <laughs> are just being a bit stupid and babyish, I think. Right, now you're having a go at my dad there, aren't you? And I think he's watching as well. <laughs> Why would I have a go at your dad? I'm not having, I don't even know your dad. I told you this story before we went on air. Dad, if you're out there, I think that it was OK to get upset because you ended up on the big stack table. Sounds like a girl to me. <laughs> Ice Sophia's got three tens. Now, it doesn't take much poker knowledge to know that that is a belter of a hand. And Lockie's hands don't have anything to do with the card in the middle. Lockie's hands? The governor's going to get you. Lockie's card, what? The governor's going to get you. Right, well, I'm not in jail, am I? So <laughs> I've, I'm, I'm probably Yet. all right for the meanwhile. <laughs> I'm just trying to help him. <laughs> You're not calling him a big girl. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes there. tough love, Michelle. <laughs> Actually, though... If he indulges hissy fits, then there'll just be more of them. <laughs> Actually, though, let's just quickly touch on that, because I'm sure there's other people out there. Um, there's two tables left in a multi-table tournament, 400 runners, so there's 20 people left. One table of the stacks are 8,000 to 16,000. And on the other table, the stacks are 25,000 to 150,000. Now, my dad had 25,000 chips, so on the other table, he would have been a huge chip leader, been a huge advantage. But he was on the big stack table, and he was the, um, the smallest stack by about 40,000 chips. But in all seriousness, that is completely irrelevant. It's just irrelevant. It's like crying about, you know, I don't but know. But it does like, make a difference when you, if, if you're short. It, make, it makes a difference, but you have to, in poker, well, it's a, it's a phrase that's transcended poker and is used in day-to-day -day life. You have to play the hand you're dealt. You do. You can't change the situation. And in a multi-table tournament, one of the things that is a random factor is your seat. Mm -hmm. In a cash game, which we'll look at later on tonight, if you don't like your seat or it's a table lineup you don't like, you can move to another cash game. In a tournament, it's just a fact of tournament play that you're stuck where you're put. Sometimes that will help you because you'll be on a table, say, where you're the biggest stack and you can mm -hmm. bully players, or on a table where you're the best player and other players are you know, folding too easy or something like that. Other times, you'll be on a table like your dad was, where he um, is the small stack, and that's harder. Uh, or alternatively, you might end up sitting to the left of a maniac who's raising every pot. You know, that's harder too. Mm -hmm. But I'm afraid, Mr. Rorp, <laughs> sir, and everybody else who wants to play in a multi-table tournament, <laughs> those are the breaks. And if you whine about them, you're playing the wrong game, because you're just going to get more upset, because these things will keep happening. It, it will break even. If you keep playing poker, it will break even. I have a really horrible feeling that my board's about to go up. <laughs> your board? <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> yeah. As in your rent. Uh, yeah, my rent. Or you'll be back in the cellar. <laughs> um, yeah, do, do they, do, did they, have they done that on purpose then? But all the big stacks on one table and small stacks on no, another? Is it purely coincidence? No, it's random. Mm. There you go, Dad. Tough love. Well done for coming 10th. Ha <laughs> ha, I can fall. Right, can we not use the show to <laughs> settle your personal scores? <laughs> well, here we are on our multi-table. So, first prize is going to be $360. It's $10 multi-table, so it's not bad. Not bad uh, return. Well, 36 times your money, that's pretty good, isn't it? And we're in the very early stages. The blinds are 10 and 20. And the significance of that is... Just going back a step for those of you that are new to the game. We know we have new players every night, so welcome aboard. Uh, the blinds are forced bets. They're the bets that the two players to the left of the dealer button. You see that white D next to Renrag? That's the dealer button. 2005 Chelsea. Uh, slightly better than 2006 Chelsea, in my view. 
and Lockie 8, forced to post the blinds, which are 10 and 20, and they have to bet those, that money before they get their cards. And that gets the action going in poker. That's what starts, that's what uh, the players initially are fighting for. Otherwise, there'd be no reason to invest money. And uh, the doodle button, as I said, moves around one space every hand, and so everyone gets a turn at play, paying the blinds. Now, in a tournament, those blinds increase. In this tournament, I think they increase every 12 minutes. Um, so they'll go from 10.20, as they are at the moment, to 20.40, and so on up. And the purpose of that is to force the action. It means in a tournament, you can't just sit there, because eventually the blinds will erode your stack and actually get rid of your stack. Um, so that forces the action and that forces a result in the tournament. It means the tournament lasts a specified amount of time. Uh, this tournament, from beginning to end, I'd imagine, will last about somewhere in between two and three hours at a complete guess. Though they do vary depending on how quickly the players play, um, by which I mean style of play rather than how long they take over their decisions. Um, so, yeah, that's our basic tournament structure. We're very early on, and I think the players. Uh, start with how many chips they start with, do you know? 1,500. 1,500. So 1,500 chips, and once they're gone, they're gone, you're out. Once they're gone, you're gone. OK, so you're looking for the best five-card hand. And there's various uh, ways of working out whether your five-card hand could be better than your opponent's, isn't there? Yes, well, this is Hold'em, so you get two cards initially, and then, as you can see, as the hand develops, cards are spread in the middle of the table, those are community cards, and that's the end of a hand when that uh, last card comes down. We've got five cards in the middle. And you are allowed to use any number of the community cards plus any number of the two cards in your hand to make your best five card holding from the seven available, Michelle. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Nice See, I can put. do it. You can. If you put your, put your mind to <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, put my mind to it. You can talk about poker. Your dad doesn't have any influence in the police force, so he can't, he can't get me or anything, can he? Oh, wow. Well. Too late now. I think he'll take a long hard look at himself and see the truth in what I've said. <laughs> Pair of kings for cast on. Sweating a little bit there, Nick. No. <laughs> I, you know, I have a commitment to the truth, Michelle. I can only, <laughs> as the viewers know, I can only call things as I see them. Well, that's a good thing. You know, if we don't like lies. Well. Trips. A yeah, Kasdan. That's his wet dream, and I think. He's got a choice. He can either check it and uh, hope somebody else catches up, or better. It's such a safe flop. It's such a perfect flop. It's hard to think of a way he can be losing. To be he doesn't honest. have to worry about anyone having a flush because there's not uh, there's not three of the same suit there. He doesn't have to worry about anyone having a straight because no. there's no way you could have a straight looking at that board. Nice. And these are things you have to take into consideration when, when, with hands, isn't it? Yeah, well, the thing about Hold'em is because there are five cards in the middle that everybody shares, you always know what the best possible hand is um, or the possibilities are because uh, the other players have to use some of, or all of those five cards as well as you. Um, so that should dictate your decisions. And that's what makes Hold'em a situational game. So there, for example, Kasdan had three of a kind. If you get the poker hand rankings chart, three of a kind is about halfway up. Um, you can get that from the internet. Just put poker hand rankings and uh, it'll pop up. Um, it's about halfway up the poker chart. Actually, the hand rankings chart should be a pyramid because in terms of the likelihood of getting it, three of a kind is actually better than halfway house. Uh, significantly better. In that situation, three of a kind is a fantastic hand to have. There are other situations. Say, for example, there were four hearts on board or four connecting cards, so seven, eight, nine uh, of hearts and then a king of hearts mm -hmm. was the board. Then three kings is a much, much weaker hand because it can easily be beaten. Yeah. So one important point if you're learning the game is to understand that the strength of your hand varies. Depending so, on what cards are on the board. Depending on what cards are on the board and what betting action has taken place. Sometimes your three of a kind is a world beater as Kasdan's was there, sometimes it's a money loser. And obviously the only thing that our players have to determine what hands other players can have is by their betting patterns. Um, but people can use this information in different ways to throw you off the track, can't they? They can. Well, the reason to hold them so popular is that it's a very subtle game and a game where you can represent a lot. Because the cards there in the middle, say mm. there are uh, three cards of one suit in the middle of three hearts. Yep. That makes a flush possible. Five of one suit is a flush. Um, and so if somebody bets, 
the other players have to consider the possibility that he might have a flush. Mm -hmm. Now, he could have anything, um, but that's where Holden has its great attraction because you can represent, you can bluff, you can overstate your hand, you can use the intelligence, um, the information you have from the cards on the board to decide what other people have. So it's a very subtle game, and it's a game with a lot of skill in it. I mean, you, know, you, could, you could pretend to have that flush and bet, but for all you know, you're betting in somebody who does actually have the flush. There's that danger slash excitement. Oh, dangerous, shell. danger. Um, but, but then if you were to bet into a, a flushing board and uh, you get called or re-raised, you can then start to wonder, you know, if they do have the flush. And if everyone folds, then you know you made a good bet. Yeah, that's one of the principles of the game that makes it unique. If you make a bet and nobody else equals that bet, then you win the hand. It doesn't matter what your cards are. So poker is the only game I know of where you can actually win with the worst score, providing everyone believes that your score is better. And if you can fool them into thinking you have the better hand, that's wonderful. Is bluffing as big a part of poker as people think? Uh, well, it isn't, Michelle. No? That's the truth of the matter. But um, we all hear, we watch all these films and programmes where it's all <coughs> about the bluff. Which, which films and programmes? All of them. Maverick. <laughs> <laughs> no. S Rounders. Lock, stock and two smoking chaff inches, Not that one. about poker. No. Rag. Uh, no, bluffing isn't as big a part of the game as you think. Uh, and if you watch the show a lot, you'll already know that. If you play poker a lot, you'll know that. Um, Actually, uh, bluffing doesn't take place as much as people think. And also, it has a fundamental problem, which is uh, when you make a bluff, you only have one way to win, and that is if the opponent throws his cards away. Um, because by definition, a bluff is betting without a good hand. Um, so if the other player calls your bet, you've lost. Now that, I'm stating the obvious, but it's important to understand that that's why there isn't as much bluffing as somebody who doesn't play a lot of poker might think. Because uh, it's hard to make it profitable, because you must be right when you do it. So bluffing can make you money, but you've got to be careful about, very selective about when you do it. Um, but it is part of the game, and pulling off a successful bluff uh, is one of the best feelings, not only in poker, but in life. Um, OK, well, we have an email here very quickly before we head over um, to one of our games. Um, from Gareth in Skelmersdale. I've heard of that. He says, hi there, guys. I just wanted to know an example of a bad beat, as I'm still unfamiliar with the term. Keep up the good work, guys. Well, this is actually quite funny because I was telling you about bad beat. I had just said, and you told me it was a rubbish bad beat. All bad beats are rubbish. <laughs> well, bad beats when you, when you think you're playing and you're going to be ahead, or you are ahead, and then you get outdrawn, isn't it? Well, yeah, a bad, a bad beat is when you're winning, but then you're winning when the money goes in usually, uh, but then the subsequent cards on future, as we've seen, the cards come out in a, a predetermined sequence, so you get two initially, then three in the middle then another one in the middle, then another one in the middle. So at some point in that sequence, you're ahead, and the other player gets lucky and defies the odds, and uh, the cards that come out after that mean that Yesterday, you're a Yesterday, I had a pair of eights, and I went all in in my multi-table tournament. And, and we the don't allow bad beats on the show, Ace two, Ace two against eights, and we, the board was ten, ten, nine. We feel that bad beats are all about luck. And poker isn't a luck game, it's a skill Can game. So we don't talk yeah. about bad beats. What? Just let me quickly. 10, 10, 9, king, king. It's not How even a good bad beat. It's just that? a standard bad beat. That's it's not so that. He didn't even hit his cards. He was just lucky that the board you, paired twice. You're about a 70 30 favourite when the money goes in. It's hardly the long shot of the century for him and to I win. I spent ages getting my stack back up and went all in with I'm Ace sorry. King, and Ace is cool. I'm sorry about this. I'm just explaining a bad beat to Gareth. Let me explain bad beats yeah. to Gareth. Gareth, bad beats are basically an illusion <laughs> because as I've just pointed out to Michelle for the third time tonight um, in oh. poker very often the other guy has a chance to win so your cards can be better but there are very few situations in poker especially in Hold'em where you've got 100% of the statistical outcomes and he's got none so if he's got any, even if he's got say you know, 5%, 1 in 20 times you're going to lose now if that happens at a bad point for you obviously it can be frustrating but what we preach on Poker Night Live is that poker is very much a skill game because it's all about putting yourself in situations where you have the best of it. If Michelle regularly puts herself in a situation where she has eights and the other guy has ace two in Hold'em, she'll be a money winner. Yes, money over winner your I am. Well, you are, aren't you? At the moment. You're ahead. At the moment, in, I am. In life. Yep. And in poker. Um, yeah, so good, excellent. 
Thanks what do you fancy? Email, well, I fancy more emails, poker at poker at live <laughs> at co.uk. I do. Or text poker at 842222. Um, here it comes. Might as well bring it up on screen for you to see. Might as well. Might as well tell them how to get in touch. Because <laughs> it's a new number, so we, we keep telling you, so you don't send it to the old one, 842222. Okay, well, we're going to head over to a cash game now. We just looked at our multi-table tournament. Now let's have a look at a cash game. So how is this going to differ from our tournament, Nick? Uh, two key differences from a tournament. One is the blinds don't go up, they stay the same forever. So this is described as a 50 cent one dollar cash game. Uh, and that's because that's the level of the blinds. Now that might sound like a very low amount. Uh, but actually you can buy them for $100. And if you win or lose a couple or three buy-ins, that's two, three hundred dollars that you can uh, be up or down yeah. and if you want to play that game regularly you'll need a few thousand dollars to do so so people very often underestimate the level of, uh, of a game um, so the first difference between this and the tournament watching is that the blinds are the same the second difference is what I just mentioned in passing which is that if you run out of money or you get low on money you can top it up you can rebuy you can go to your bank uh, or your account or the cashier's window if you're in a casino and get more chips Whereas in a tournament, you get a certain amount of chips at the start, and when they're gone, you're out. Uh, so cash games are part of the eternal cycle of life. And you can come and go as you please, can't you, as well? Yeah, yeah. That you, can't, you can't come and go every other hand, but you, you can drop out of the game, then come back, and yeah, you can do that. Um, the slight difference, um, the, key, the key difference is really that the blinds stay the same, and that uh, leads you to a slightly different style of play, well a very different style of play, because in tournaments uh, there's pressure to play, whereas in a cash game there is very, very minimal pressure to play. And generally, there are no, there are no kind of definitive statements in poker, but generally speaking it means that uh, you, a winning style of play in a cash game tends to be, tends to be a tighter, more patient style of play. And I was waiting in, for bigger cards, bigger hands. For bigger cards. Uh, Whereas in tournaments, you do get the opportunity to bluff more and make more uh, elaborate moves. Well, it'll be interesting to see what types of hands these players are playing with. First of all, let's have a quick uh, shout out to all of them. We've got Cat Attack, Portman Road, High Low, Tragic Trev, Benny Pump, DJ Dual Boy, Snap It, and Gullo. Um, here we can see, actually, this is, I think, good um, to have a look at, Nick, because they both have hit their king, but Gullo's in there with a very raggy king. So he's done the right thing there. But then I think that's because, um, obviously, the ace come down, so he got away with that, didn't he? Because he got worried about that ace. Yeah, one of those situations where they're both in the blinds, and uh, the blinds are an area, these are the four bets we mentioned before, and these are an area where players, actually, of all, of all levels, I believe, uh, lose a lot of money, because um, you end up playing hands you wouldn't otherwise play, or you do if you're not being careful because you're already involved by putting in the blind bet. Um, players feel compelled to play. What happens is, what happened there to Gullo, they catch a bit um, and they're, suddenly they're playing a hand with King 3, which they wouldn't normally do. Um, so the blinds are a danger area for players, especially for beginning and intermediate players. Snap It, one of our regular players, contributed to the forum and the show. Good evening. Snap It has flop top set. Very nice. Yes. Three of a kind, three sixes. Always nice. Not quite as strong as Kasdan's three of a kind before, because there is a flush draw and a straight draw out there. And someone could even have the straight already with seven eight if they were playing a Mark Bannon. You're absolutely right. It's not a straight draw, is it? Possible made straight, you're right. Well Keep done. Your eye on the board. Yeah, sharp. There's a percentage of pre-flop folds. Benny Pump there with 74%. Now you might wonder why we show these, but this actually tells us whether our players are playing tight or loose, doesn't it? Um, so 70, our tightest player at the moment is DJ Dual Boy, who's playing, uh, only playing 33% of hands. 23. No, sorry, 23% of hands. And our loosest player is Neil Lowe, who's playing 38% of hands. And of that percentage of hands they're playing, this is how much they're winning. Gullo is winning 60% of the time. Now, Dual is only winning 23% of the time, but if he's had bigger wins on those times, then he may well uh, be ahead. So keep that in mind. So 
So, firstly, you're dealt two cards. You've got to try and decide whether you're going to play them or not. Because bear in mind, it's going to cost you a pound to call the big blind, which is because, not a pound, a dollar, sorry. It's all done in dollars on these sites. Now, deciding on which two cards you're going to play with has a lot to do with your position, doesn't it? Uh, yes, it does, yes. No question. Look at that for Tragic Trav. Three queens. Oh, nice. And perfect, because Hilo's got uh, eights and queens. So, one of the things that we try and get people to understand quite quickly is there are no good hands in poker, only good situations. Um, what I mean by that is you can have the best hand in the world. If none of your opponents uh, have anything, it's Doesn't matter. not worth very much. And that does happen, and it's very annoying when it happens. I think you and your dad get a bit too annoyed about the whole <laughs> poker experience. <laughs> It'll be a little bit well, more calm. You're telling me you don't get annoyed when you're sitting on the big blind with a pair of aces and have one folds, do you? I don't get annoyed when I play poker. No? No. Nope. You're placid. I am. I am, honestly. Liar. <laughs> I'm not. I never get annoyed playing poker. See, the, the most annoyed I've ever been, play, been playing poker is when Mark Bannon outdrew me in the commentator's tournament. <laughs> <laughs> that did annoy me. You weren't happy, were No, you? but... Um, I don't get annoyed when I play poker. I've played too much poker to get annoyed. You understand it, all the different well, outcomes. <laughs> after you've been playing for a couple of years, you just see everything. And you see horrendous beats and you see... And you, you understand that you'll get your fair share of lucky breaks and your fair share of unlucky breaks. And <clears throat> it's not a case of me or any other poker player being, you know, superior or clever because they don't get annoyed. It's just that if you play enough, you've got to be a bit stupid to keep getting annoyed because you understand that it's part of the game. Mm. And you also understand that you get your rewards by playing well. And um, sometimes the guy will get lucky on you, but most of the time you'll take his money. And you, you understand yeah. that by actually happening over a period of weeks, months and years. It's not a case of looking at the facts and understanding, it's a case of experiencing it. <clears throat> so I, I don't really get annoyed when I play, and, and most players that have been playing for a long time don't. Would you get annoyed if you'd... Fair enough, if you were playing and, and anything could happen, you think that's fair enough, I did the right thing. Do you get annoyed if you make a mistake? Yeah, you I, do, made a mistake? I do get annoyed when I make mistakes, but I, that's a different kind of annoyed. It's not... Mm. I get disappointed if I make mistakes. And I, I, I probably obsess over them a bit unhealthily as well. Well, it is annoying sometimes when you do something and you know, and after you think, why did I do that? Well... I think that's one of the things you get better at with experience because you listen to that little voice more and more the more you play and um, you, uh, you act on your instinct a lot more because your instinct develops. Your instinct's not anything mystical. It's your experience of lots of hours of playing time feeding the answer back to you. Yeah, you'll subconsciously be taken in particular scenarios, won't you? So Exactly. Um, so you have the answer and... <clears throat> you do stop making that kind of mistake more. That's an interesting situation. Do you wisey boy should actually raise there? Uh, what's happened is um, he's left the table and come back and he's missed his blinds. Now everybody has to pay the blinds, so in order to make it fair, he has to put in the amount of the blinds, which is $1.50. Mm -hmm. Everybody's passed around to him. Now, the technically correct thing to do there is to raise. And the reason for that is that um, he's got money committed to the pot. So have other players but he has position on them. And by raising, he protects his investment in the pot and makes it very likely that he'll take the blinds uh, there and then. And in late position, when you've had to pay the blinds and nobody else plays, you should actually raise the two cards. Yeah? Yeah. That's just a little, that's just a little freebie. Because more often than not, you'll take those blinds. Well, more and often than not, you, you don't, take those you've blinds got and position anyway. You've got position, and um, it just protects your, it protects your investment that you've had to make. It's actually an advantage because you're paying your blinds in a better position than if you, where you normally pay your blinds, so mm -hmm. you should make the most of that advantage. Now, Benny Pumpendumpen has got the aces and should take this down here. Good flop for aces, three undercards, no scary connectors or anything like that. The thing that I want to get across to people just starting the game is that it's very important to learn the, the starting hands and which two cards you should play and which you shouldn't, and which you should play in position. But that's only one piece of the puzzle. Um, it's my view that over the last year or two, far too much emphasis has been put in poker on the first two cards in Hold'em. Uh, and that's because a lot of the poker on TV is the end of a tournament 
Mm -hmm. And at the end of the tournament, the blinds get big and all the decisions are about the first two cards. Yeah. But if you're playing normal poker, particularly if you're playing in a cash game, um, it's much more important to be a very good player after the flop as well as before the flop. So you need to, you need to learn the first two cards, but you also need to understand that um, that's only the beginning of the story. And you have to know when, like for example, you, everyone, it's not difficult to understand that a pair of aces is the best hand. Mm -hmm. It's not difficult under, to understand that normally when you've got a good hand you should raise because it's like <clears> a business, you're investing money when conditions are right. Mm -hmm. um, but then after the flop, there are some flops that are good for aces and some flops that are bad for aces. So understanding when your heart cards are strong after the flop and when they're weak is very, very important. I'm just rambling on. No, it's very important. It is important, like you say, because uh, so many people that have a good big hand before they flop with like aces or kings or, or even queens, especially, um, when that flop comes out, there's so many things that all of a sudden could be beating you. Mm -hmm. um, but if you've still got a big hand, it's very difficult to put it down sometimes. It's something you have to be able to do. Because anyone, anybody now could have two pair or anybody could have trips, mm -hmm. a pocket pair and hit their third pair. So your, like you say, it is only one pair. So your aces may not be good after the flop. Yeah, that's what you've got to understand. You're holding one pair um, and uh, they were the best possible hand before the flop. They are almost never the best possible hand after the flop. And this actually, it it, this is why raising pre-flop is uh, something that you should be doing with big hands, or can be doing with big hands, isn't it? Because it gives you information about the types of people that are going to be playing with you in that hand. Well, it, um, it potentially does several things. It gives you information about people that will be playing with you, that's right. If they're prepared to put in extra money um, after you've raised before the flop, then presumably they have something worthwhile. Mm -hmm. More importantly, it forces players that could uh, catch cards on the flop to beat you, it forces them out. Um, so it thins the field. There's two different reasons to raise actually. One is to thin the field, the other is to build the pot. Um, and uh, so you need to be aware of what you're doing. And it's so easy to forget what happened pre-flop. You find yourself at the turn or something and you think, um, right, what could this guy have? What happened pre-flop? And you forget because you haven't taken it in. Uh, it does come with time, but it's so difficult to to try and remember each step of what's been going on. Because there is four betting rounds, and it is important to remember what people have done to give you information. <coughs> it's, it? it's vital to it's vital to remember what people have done on different streets, because um, it will often that will often be the key thing in deciding your action. Say somebody makes a big bet at the end of a hand at the river into you. One of, one of the key things to decide is looking back through the hand and ascertaining whether he could have what he's representing. Say the flush card comes on the end and he makes a big bet, you know, is it likely that he has the flush? Well, if he's called your bet on the flop and called your bet on the turn, there's a decent likelihood he has got the flush. Mm -hmm. If you've both just checked along the whole time and then suddenly this big bet comes out of nowhere, uh, well, it's less likely that he has the flush, it's more likely he's just trying to nick the pot. Mm. So, you, what his act, yeah, you do need to remember what's happening during the course of a hand. And it's little tidbits of information like that, like that that really help. That if somebody is, is calling your bets, then they're more likely that they're, they're chasing a flush or a straight. And if someone is just checking, then it's more likely they're trying to nick the pot. Yeah. And little things like that you don't think about when you first start playing. No, well, well, I always say this, don't I, which is the different levels of poker thinking, which is when you start out, you're basically concerned with your own cards mm -hmm. and what you're doing and what your game plan is. But as quickly as possible, you want to move from that to the second level of poker thinking, which is, what has my opponent got? Um, what do his bets tell me about his hand? What do I know about his play from uh, previous hands I've played with him? Mm. Um, what are the possibilities that, for his hand in relation to the board? And so on and so on. And then eventually, you want to move to the third level of poker thinking, which is the really exciting one, because this, this can make you more money than the others, which is, uh, what does he think I've got? Um, and by... Uh, figuring out what he thinks you've got, you can really start to mani manipulate him. So three levels of poker thinking. That's a scary board. Not if you're high-low, isn't it? Not if you're high-low. It's a brilliant board. It's got a little full house. Yeah. Again, no such thing as a good hand, any good situation. Neither of the other players had anything. Do 
Dewey Boy's actually on our multi-table tournament as well. We could go and have a look how he's doing, because he's playing in two games. Shall we? Let's give him his 17.8 seconds of fame. <laughs> Chewy boy, here we go, we're following you. There he is, top right. Now he's got 2,000 chips. Now, I don't know what the average is right now. Uh, Ram chips on 6,000 though, so he's a much bigger stack. He's chip leader, Ram chip. So it looks like... Dewey Boy must be either average or just above average because everyone else on this table is uh, hanging around the mid thousands. Again, multi table tournament 130 runners, 120 runners, all the way down to one final table, which we'll be watching at the end of the night as Ghost Zapper takes a pop. And still early stages in this tournament. Buffy be goods already in panic mode, sticking in all the chips. 520 to win 75, not the, not the best return ever. And also with a hand like King Jack, if he does get called, he's going to be behind. So not too sure about that idea. Ace 10, Hoik Balls, a razor, raising hand. Razor by trade. Hoik Balls, regular contributor to the show. Shout out to you. Send us an email, Hoik. Yeah, Hoik. And remember, if you do have any questions, that text number is 84222. 84222. It is a new number. And do remember to put the word poker first and then your question. And you can email as well, poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. Yeah, get the emails coming in, guys. We need entertaining. Yeah, entertain us, please. Remember, it's your show, and uh, if you've got anything that's puzzling about the game or anything you want to talk about, you will dictate the content of this evening, guys. Do you remember I'm going to be playing in a sit and go to one that we'll be watching at 12? Beat up the presenter. Beat up the presenter. There it is. And uh, we tend to watch a whole sit and go tournament most every night anyway. Um, so, in this feature, um, one of the presenters plays in it and that way you can just say why you were doing what you were doing and um, tonight's now it tonight so nick's the expert and he can come comment on my play yes. but i won last time i was with you you did you so kicked butt kicked butt so let's see if i can do that again i'm going to set it back to the cash game here we are we just thought you might want to see nick and i nick and mine's little faces there on screen <laughs> of course they do <laughs> Foreman Rhodes got the winning hand here and a free roll to a flush as well. I think there's only one card that Jimmy Boy can catch to win the hand, in fact, which would have been the four of clubs. Oh, and he puts in 13. Well, he's bluffing and it's put Pullman Rhodes in a difficult position. I don't think he's bet enough, Jimmy Boy. No, he hasn't. If that had been a bigger bet, it would have put Pullman Rhodes in a difficult situation. Because yeah. he had the flush, but he only had the five. Um, you do get some interesting bluffing opportunities when there are four of one suit on the board. But you've got to be brave because obviously your opponent only needs one card which matches to have that flush. Um, and there, Dewey Boy had a good idea, but I don't think better enough to intimidate Paul Road into throwing that away. Um, in a cash game, do you need to be blind stealing? Because I know it's a big part of a tournament. Um, do, would you still do things the, like rag aces and not to the, steal? Not to the same extent. I mean, if, if everyone's passed round to you in late position, then you take the opportunity to pick up some free money, definitely, because it's all profit. Mm -hmm. um, there's not the same pressure to do it as there is in a tournament, because um, the blinds are never the same percentage of your stack. Um, so it's not as worthwhile to steal the blinds. But it still has a value, no question. Um, so, yeah, you should do it. If the, if the action's passed around to you and you're on the button, um, you should raise with only two half-decent cards, really. Mm. Um, but it, as ever in poker, it depends on the players in the blinds. 
If the players in the blinds are, you know, players that call a lot and like defending their blinds, well, then you should only do it with above average cards because you don't want to be um, putting yourself into a situation where you're behind. So, as ever, vary it depending on the game you're in. But no, there isn't the same pressure as there is in a tournament. Pair of greens for Snap It. Pair of sixes for Cat Attack. Very scary board for pair of sixes. And then nothing for Portland Road. Now the sixes are bet out. Yeah. That's a funny bet because he's bet $8 to win $3.50. It's worked. It's worked, but it's it's not one that I'd recommend you doing at home. Or in a casino. <laughs> Or in a tent. Because mathematically it doesn't make any sense. You're, you're, or in a tent. <laughs> if you're playing poker and you're camping. <laughs> Raise with the nines. Like, like I said at the beginning, we're going to have a look at um, the action that different people do and uh, see if Nick thinks it's a good thing or a bad thing to be doing. So a raise with a pair. Fair enough. Pre-flop. But the smaller pairs, it's sometimes difficult to make a raise with. Well... In No Limit Hold'em, you want to view nines as a small pair. Okay. And well, that's what that. you want. That's what you want. But that will only happen once every once uh, seven and a half to one to connect with your pair to do what Dewey Boy's just done. So you don't want to be relying on that. And the problem with nines is that there will usually be one, uh, actually usually be two overcards on the flop, um, one or two. So. If you if you raise and you're called, it's a decent bet that your opponent has overcards in his hand or one overcard, and when the flop hits, it's very difficult to know if you're ahead or not. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're going to raise with a hand like a pair of nines, like Drew Boy, you've got to know why you're doing it. Um, now in that situation, he had position. He was on the button. He was the last to act, which is a massive advantage in Holden being the last to act because you know what everyone else has done, and so his raise, if he did it because of that, makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because he can raise, people will probably check to him, and if they miss the flop, he can probably bet and take it. But the important thing to understand is, he's done that with a pair of nines, he might as well do that with 7-8 as well, or ace-3, or anything like that, because he's making that play based on his position. Okay. If he's making it based on his cards, I'd say it's a dubious thing to do, because most of the time, he'll be facing over cards and he won't know whether he's ahead or not. Usually. Raising with a pair of nines um, on the strength of the hand is questionable. Again, so if you were in early position, maybe you wouldn't... In early position, it's not a raising hand in a cash game, okay. in my view. But everybody plays differently. Um, I, I would recommend all beginners to treat, and I know this from experience, because I lost a lot of money with nines in my first two years playing Hold'em, um, I think the tip is treat nines, they look a bit like sixes, so play them the same way you play sixes okay. and you'll actually save money. They look much better than they are a pair of nines. Unless uh, you can do what Dewey Boy did and find another one on the flop, then they're... Which is lovely. A little bit more tasty. Well, it looks like the Ace King is going to take, take it down without having to see a flop, which isn't bad with Ace King. You can do so much money with Ace King, I find. Um, in tournaments especially. If if you lose money with any starting hand, Michelle, that's why starting hand importance is overrated. Ace King looks so lovely though. Well, Ace King, Ace King is a strong hand. Um, obviously, the two highest cards. The, the, its main strength is that <coughs> the main strength of Ace King is that uh, when you hit a pair, mm -hmm. you're guaranteed to have the top pair possible. Um, so if you hit, you're guaranteed to have the top pair possible with the best possible side card, the best possible kicker. If you flip a pair of kings, you've got the Ace kicker. And um, if you've got a pair of aces, you've got the king kicker. Mm -hmm. So that's where its real strength lies. When you miss the flop, um, it becomes a weak hand. Because the thing to understand is when you miss the flop, you've just got ace high. And Michelle and I and everyone else that presents the show and watches the show sees people fall in love with ace king every night. And uh, because it's just one of the stronger hands before the flop, they get attached to it. Um, so yeah, it does lose a lot of its value if you miss the flop and you need a bit of skill and judgment to decide when you should bet after the flop and when you shouldn't. Um, and there are a whole lot of things to take into account there, uh, too numerous to mention, 
Uh, but a few things you need to be aware of is how many opponents you face. The fewer opponents you face, the more likely it is that you should bet um, what the table image is of you. If you're seen as a tight player, you should be more likely to bet because people will believe that you have it. Um, and so on and so on. There are other factors. But basically, you need to bring your judgment into play if you miss the flop. Um, in tournaments, again, ace-king is a hand a lot of people go out with uh, because um, it looks strong. They put their stack in. They only have ace-high. They're called by a pair, and any pair, uh, you may not know this if you're new to the game, heads up, two hands, uh, where all the money goes in before the flop, any pair is a favourite over ace-king. Um, now, the caveat that, ace-king is a better hand than a small pair in a game because it plays better after the flop so you know where you are with ace-king, whereas with a small pair and overcards come, it's very hard to know if you're ahead or behind. So ace-king is a hand you should play more, but in tournaments where the money goes in before the flop, it's a hand people often go out for tournaments with, as mm. you've obviously experienced. Yeah, a few times, because it does, you see ace-king, you think, right, I'll go all in. But like you well, say, if you're up against <coughs> even a pair of fours, you're, you're behind. Yeah, sometimes you do have to commit to it. It has some strength, it's just that people overestimate it, overrate it. So you'd rather, in the late stages of a tourney, be committing your stack to something like a pair, a, a medium pair, than you would something like Ace King. Yeah, I mean, they're much of a muchness. They're about the same level of strength in, in a tournament, I think. Uh, well, well, we have an email here from Miss Vova Vova. Hello, Missy. I'm you like her, her don't you? Yeah, we have a good little chat, and uh, Mrs. Bandit as well. So a few, few, few of us girlies that stick together when we play, gang up against the men. The girls are allowed <laughs> to play nowadays. And I'm just going to ignore that and carry on. Don't worry, girls. I'll hit him later. Don't. Hi, Michelle and Nick. I've totally lost all confidence in my game and I'm knowingly calling races with junk but just can't help it. I know when I'm playing well and these awful numbers I'm calling with now could be binned without a moment's hesitation. I feel I do have a good, na good game and regularly cash out most days, apart from the last few days. And what is the best thing to do? I have the bankroll to continue, but I'm going into games games thinking I'm going to lose. This obviously isn't the best state of mind um, to start with. Shall I play through it or take a break for a couple of days? I'm thinking of buying some poker books, never previously read any, and use this time reading them um, instead of playing, um, and then go back to the tables. Many thanks for your, advi for your advice in advance. Um, oh, Miss blah, 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 blah. I think everybody goes through a stage, don't they, where they're just not happy. Yeah, I mean... The, the fact of the matter is, in poker, you're going to have a losing run, and um, it doesn't matter. You can be the best player in the world and you'll have a losing run, unfortunately. It's just the nature of the game. As we were talking about before, there are very few situations where um, you have 100% of the statistical advantage, and sometimes you'll have a run where the other guy hits all of his long shots. Um, and uh, it's actually not that unusual. Like I said, every player in the poker world will experience it. Uh, Miss Vosavova, you have my sympathy. And, uh, so what about her call, knowingly calling things rubbish and getting involved when well, she shouldn't? Well, it's, it's pretty clear to me. She's got the plan for success, which is to take a break. Um, if you're knowingly making mistakes because you're you know, desperate or low on confidence or um, whatever, then, then you, you know in your heart you need to make a mistake. I mean, because it actually sounds like you're already trying to play through it and that's not working. Miss Vava Vava, you, you had loads of chips the other day when I went out of the multi-table tournament. You were doing so well. That Things can go bad, though. Maybe they went bad for her. Um, sorry, it's not going well, but yeah, definitely take a break. Definitely read some poker books, but maybe take a break altogether for three or four days and go and, you know, sniff the fresh air and enjoy the bird song somewhere. Uh, and then good, come back to poker refreshed. You're a good player, Missy. I've watched you play, so you get back on top there. Well, we're heading to um, a break now. We've got the poker news. When we return, I'll be doing the beat of the presenter, so you're going to be hearing a lot of Nick lovely voice in the next hour. Um, if you do have any questions, do remember to text them to 84222 and uh, email poker at yeah, as well. Yeah, lots of emails for the next hour. Yeah, please, for Nick. So make sure you ask Nick lots of questions because he'll be on his own. I do get lonely. Right, we're going to a break. We'll see you shortly. See you in a bit. Hello everyone, Poker Night Live is back. Didn't take that long, did it? Uh, this is, uh, what day is it? It's Wednesday. It's Wednesday night, it's Poker Night Live. Wednesday, over the hill day, isn't it? Rest of the week, write it off and stay with us till two. And it's the long weekend, isn't it, this weekend? It's bank holiday, although I've got to work on Sunday night. Oh, God. On Easter. Did you do anything but complain? <laughs> Seriously. No, I'm looking forward to it. I got a bad beat, I've got to work. No, no, no. Two things. 
to you know, <laughs> you had to make up the third with no, 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 no. Yeah, but there'll be others, won't there? That's what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> guys, you, well I'm sure you've got a long weekend to celebrate the uh, death and resurrection of our Lord and also eat chocolate. So uh, you can stay with us till two. I know you can. Now, you what we need... If you any chocolate Easter eggs, that's fine. That is fine. Uh, what we need is text and emails to get us through till two. Uh, we've got several already, but we want lots, lots more, guys. We haven't got very many good ones, to be honest. So this is your chance to step up and get your name read out on telly, get your question answered. Anything you like about poker, the text number's there. Just text poker and your question, 84222. And uh, email if you prefer, poker at Poker Night Live. You can ask us anything, whether you want to ask us a difficult uh, technical question, whether you're a beginner, it's the first time you're finding the show. We know we have new viewers every night, so welcome aboard. Do get in touch. Remember, this is your show, and what we talk about is dictated by you. Ask us anything. Entertain us. Michelle's playing online. I will be doing, just shortly. You're waiting to get in, aren't you? I'm going to be clicking. So if you want to watch her play online uh, while watching us uh, on the telly... I'm going to win again. You do both. There you go. That's fighting talk. That wasn't even a scintilla of doubt in that, was there? No. Nope. You did Confident. win. You won last time we were on together. I didn't did you? win, so you can be my lucky charm because J James is my bad luck charm. Yes. And, I, and I, James makes me lose and then has a go at me, whereas with you I win. Yes, because I show you my lucky charms. Um, so she'll be doing that, and uh, then at twelve, top of the hour, we'll be replaying the tournament that she's played in and analysing it, uh, looking for good and bad points, learning areas. Last time you didn't find any bad points. I don't think there were any, were there? That. I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's fair enough, because I don't think there were any. Let's see if there so are So plenty of bad points tonight, I so think, you can learn. Yeah, the law of averages suggests <laughs> there will be, doesn't it? Uh, let's go to some poker action, guys. Get the text and emails coming in. We're going to go to a single table tournament. This is our $10. And it's in the second level. We can tell that from the blinds, which you can see indicated at the top of the shop, top of the screen. 20 and 40. The blinds double every 10 hands. And Mrs. Votovova, who should be taking a break from poker. <laughs> there she is. And I think she might be in trouble. Yeah, we've joined her in a horrible situation. I think she's got the best hand with top pair. Unfortunately, DVN's flop two pair and her. Mrs. Votovova, Mrs., I've just married you off, but you kept your name. Do you see that? Uh, to be honest, you were short stacked. I don't know how you got short stacked. That's obviously another story. But in that hand, not too much you can do. That's a horrible flop for you especially as you're both in the blinds. Bad luck. Now go and take a break. Have a lie down. Get yourself a nice book and perhaps an episode of Super Nanny. Yep. One of my personal favourites. Hello to several regulars. Buffy Be Good, Nasha Nuvis, who farted, and also to people we don't know. New friends, I like to call you. Hey says hi, I haven't seen. DVN, I haven't seen. Matt, Ace, King, Queen, Jack, Temp. Just going to call you Matt, if that's all right. <laughs> and a special hello to Posh Boy, one of my favourites, because my mum supports Posh. Peterborough Football Club, in line for the playoffs. Just. It's going to be a tight run thing, I think, isn't it, Posh Boy? Send us an email, poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. Tell us all about it. <laughs> one for Matt, and on we go. Are you in a game yet, Michelle? No. I've got all my um, chocolate ready. My, my, <laughs> my, my chocolates. What did I say? Me chocolates. Oh dear. That's just weird. It doesn't make any sense. I'm just waiting for Fish Fish and Earl and Quite Tight and um, all the person that just went to finish and then I'm going to get in there. Good stuff. 8-6 versus a 7 DVN. Flops the seven and eight is going to be his pot. Straightforward. And so Miss Fosfov is the first to leave us. Seven remain. I'm sure you all know how this works by now, but just in case you're one of our uh, new viewers, this is an eight seater tournament. And these guys will play No Limit Hold'em with the thousand chips they get at the beginning. And like the multi-table tournament we were watching, when those chips run out, they are out of the tournament. And basically, it's a last man standing kind of a deal. 
in that one of the players will end up with all 8,000 chips in his or her hands. Uh, the prize money that they're playing for, all real cash games on Poker Night Live, the prize money they're playing for is made up of the buy-ins, uh, and those consist of $10 per man, so $80 prize pot, and that's divided 50% for the first place finisher, 30% for second, 20% for third. So a nice $40 prize for whoever wins this tournament. And these uh, one tables are fast and fun, usually last about half an hour. That's why we bring them to you on Poker Night Live. They are fast, entertaining poker. It takes a particular type of player to play in them. Hoof Hearted, Hoof Feet in seat three. We know is a good player of these tournaments, has a very good record. And if you want to play in these tournaments, you could do worse than watch his play, to be honest. He likes to play reasonably tight early on, but then later on, when the blinds get bigger and it gets shorthanded, he's not afraid to change gears, put his chips in with worse hands, and uh, even bluff if the time is right. And you have to be able to change gears in these tournaments, no question. Reminding you, we're looking for texts and emails on any subject you like. If you're playing one of our tournaments tonight, we'd love to hear from you. If you're not, that's fine too. We'd still love to hear from you. I'm in. Michelle's in. If you want to watch her on the intranet, feel free to do so and abuse stroke compliment her in the chat box. <laughs> Although, if you are abusive to her or me, your emails won't get read out, so bear that in mind because we are very petty, shallow people. Gam, look, he's always on my left. I'm going to steal your blinds, Gam, and you, Grey Hump. There we are. Grey and P, sorry. <laughs> Oh, I'll show my bell again again. Show my bell. You need to work with your clicky fingers. Because you've got to be quicker. If what Michelle's saying is making no sense to you, then welcome aboard. You're in the same club as me. <laughs> Buffy Be Good and Posh Boy have the same hand. Let's see if DVN wants to play as King Jack. Well, whoever's boldest is going to take this pot. Buffy Be Good is in there for... Oh, and Posh Boy calls. That's a surprise. It's actually a good call. And they split it up. Good call by Posh Boy. I don't quite know how he did it. Perhaps it wasn't a good call. Perhaps it was madness that worked out. The mysteries of this game. As I said, we do want to hear from you guys. And... Uh, any topic you like. How about what poker are you going to play over the Easter weekend? Are you going to be playing live anywhere? What are you going to be playing in? Will you be committing yourself to four long days of online fun? Poker at pokernightlive.co.uk To keep us informed, we'll give you a shout out. And of course for all your questions. So you see Buffy be good. Come over the top, re-raised from the big blind. Very strong play. And uh, that's a nice tournament move by Buffy be good. Knows that uh, Matt, Ace, King, etc. could just be trying to steal the blinds from the button. Has got an OK hand, got a pair, so not, not the end of the world if called. Um, so a little bit of backup, but the main thing is playing the man, playing the position. And re-raising from the small blind, re-raising from the big blind is something you'll see a lot in uh, good quality tournaments. In fact, that move is so well known that you'll now see the re-re-steal happening in tournaments. So somebody makes a steal from the button, the player in the blind knows it's a steal, so tries to come over the top. The player in the button knows that the player in the blind knows that his move was initially a steal, so he comes back over the top again to say, no, actually, I do have a hand. And that's a move that's happening more in tournaments. It won't happen so much, if at all, in the, in the one-table tournaments we're watching, uh, because without being... Um, Anyway, disingenuous, these are more intermediate level players and these are the top players that would make this move. But also because the structure doesn't allow it, this is a move that you'll see a lot more in uh, the big tournaments where the players have lots of chips in relation to the blinds. But something to put in your tournament playbook to use when the time is right. Are you still in, Michelle? Yep. Fabulous. <laughs> I'm not out yet. You're in profit. <laughs> Slightly. Slightly in profit. Queens versus Aces. Bad situation for Posh, posh Boy. Great situation for Hoofy. Now, how does Hoofy want to play? Does he want to re raise or call? He's going to re raise. And I think it's going to be very difficult for Posh Boy to get away from this. 
very hard to fold a pair of queens, and he's now going to have to catch a queen, or some sort of, uh, oh, he could catch another club for a uh, horrible beat for Hoofy. Note the aces stand up. Unlucky, possible, well, unlucky to find aces behind you. Not impossible to throw them away. You know, we know Hoofy wouldn't make that move without a very strong hand. And uh, if you were playing the player there and you knew how Hoofy plays, possibly you could have thrown it away, but very difficult to do. And uh, nobody's going to be too critical of you for losing most of your chips with that. Now all in with the fives. Let's hope they stand up. Ace King for DVN versus the Jacks versus the Fives. Jacks are now a big favourite in this hand. Ace or a King or a Five. There's a Five, my goodness. Well, Buffy Good will win most of the chips with the Jacks. PUFC boy obviously can only win the amount that he had at the beginning of the hand off the other players. So, But he does survive. Back up to 240. Back in with a, an outside chance of doing something in this tournament. Interesting hand. DVN got very lively with the ace king there, and as we were discussing, it's a treacherous hand. Now, Posh Boy's going to go all in with the a7. Come on, Posh Boy, I'm unashamedly biased. It's mainly for my mum. Peterborough United, what a, what a football club. No help for anyone on that flop. Posh Boy's ace is still good here. Two pairs with the ace. And unfortunately not anymore. Buffy Be Good catches the nine and will bust Posh Boy. Unlucky. Why not send us an email telling us all about it? Did you even consider throwing away those queens, I wonder, when Hoofy came over the top? Poker at pokernightlive.co.uk for you or anyone else that wants to get in touch. And we're down to six players. Matt goes all in with the ace three, and DVN makes a good call and comes over the top with the ace ten. Well, look at that uh, get out of jail free card for Matt. Catches it straight on the end. The bottom line is yes, he got lucky in catching that straight, but he did the right thing. This is the important thing when you analyse a poker hand. Did the players do the right thing? The blinds were coming up, Matt was short stacked, he found an ace, he stuck his chips in. That was the right thing to do. He made the right move and he was rewarded for it. Now I understand he got lucky in that hand if you want to express it that way. But the bottom line is, did he make the right decision? He did. Did DVN make the right decision? Well, he probably did too because he also knew that Matt was desperate and short stacked. He had uh, an above average hand ace 10 and he decided to try and pick up Matt's chips. Uh, so he, it was probably one of those hands which you can get in poker where both players do the right thing, but there has to be a loser. Interesting situation. Another interesting situation here. They both have the same hand. And DVN probably has to put his last chips in, even though he's in terrible shape. Split pot here, and uh, Nash Nubis will be thankful because he had to have a split pot, otherwise he was out. Ace eight for Matt, DVN's all in. Nothing he can do about that. He's basically all in for the blind. He's actually not as badly off as you think. Probably about only a two to one underdog, although now he's in lots of trouble because he's got one card left. A four would make him a straight. Five or a two. No dice. And we're down to five players. And we're just going to break away briefly to slip in a crafty email. Uh, we'll get through lots of emails tonight, I promise, guys. So do keep them coming in. Somebody that's emailed is Bryboy99. Good evening, Bryboy. Thanks for emailing. Uh, he says, hi, Nick and Michelle. Check this out, Michelle. Oh, my God, I somebody's... Must... So... Oh, sorry, what? go on. I'm just in the middle of doing a show. <laughs> uh, oh, I didn't even know you were on. <laughs> yeah, no, we're on. It's a live show. It goes on for four hours. All right, um, sorry, I'm... Don't, don't panic, by the way. We've frozen the, uh, the single table we were watching. 
So uh, you're not going to miss anything with this going on. Uh, so don't panic. Um, Somebody's got got my name, Chipness, and they're saying all stuff in the in the chat box, and it's not me they, saying. They've it, been by doing the way. that for weeks and be the presenter. Tell them it's tedious and old and lame. It, Whoever's it, doing it's tedious and old and lame. Tedious, old and lame. So stop it. And yeah. I, I'm going to have to get code. Um, Bry boy has emailed us. Michelle, do listen to the oh, first bit. Okay. I must say, you both make a handsome couple. <laughs> handsome. <laughs> Uh, it I always makes my day. Oh, no, listen, it's nice. It always makes my day when you two are presenting. Aww. Also, Michelle is improving her game by the minute. Oh, thank you. Just be watching another Michelle, I think. Um, <laughs> no, she, no, you are, to be fair. That's very kind, Bri Boy. Uh, my question is uh, Do you think there's a best time of day to play online? Do you think an average poker player's chances could be improved by the time of day that they play? Just a thought. Looking forward to seeing how Michelle does like Warmest of Grass. Well, thank you for such a nice email, Bri Boy. Um, <laughs> what's funny? So uh, <laughs> nothing. Carry on. Brilliant. That works. <laughs> that works really well on on Teddy Michelle. No, just giggling can, about can something that I've you're got. having in your head. <laughs> everyone can see what type of mug I've got. It's actually Nick's. <laughs> yeah, you've got you've got a mug with a homosexual man on it. Brilliant. Um, good luck with that. Uh, Bri boy, in answer to your question, uh, is there a best time to play online? Well, there there are good and bad times to play poker. If you're talking about in terms of profit. Um, and those times are when your opponents are tired and or inebriated. Um, any time you have an edge, obviously, is a good time to play. So any time your, players have been playing, your opponents have been playing for a long time uh, and they're tired um, or they've been playing for a short time, it's just a time of day where they're tired is good. Um, so if you're looking to have that edge, it really depends which websites you play on. Some sites are uh, British-based, tend to have more British players, European players, um, or Scandinavian-based or whatever. Others are American-based, so I uh, quite often play on an American site. And the best time of day to play on that is uh, can be sort of afternoon, uh, our time, because it's early hours American time, and the Americans that are playing on the website are not playing their best game either because they're tired or because they're playing for fun and they're you know have had a couple of uh, beverages. Um, so yeah, there is a good time to play online, and also you'll find live. There are people that specialise in doing this. There are people who uh, will come into casinos and card rooms late at night, 12, 1 o'clock, and they've geared their whole routine, they're professionals, and they've geared their whole routine to playing when other people are at their worst, either through fatigue or drink or whatever. Um, so you can definitely get an edge that way. Uh, thank you for the email, Bri Boy. Um, we'll take another one. Are you all right there, Nick? I'm grand, yeah. Just in a hand. Yeah. Ooh, that's a brilliant hand, Michelle. <laughs> Hope that helps you. Um, this is from Stamper. Thanks for this, Stamper. It's a technical question, but it's not one we've had before, so I thought I'd tackle it. Um, he says, let's say two people are vying online for a pot of $20 and one cent after the rake. At the showdown, the players reveal that the hand is a tie and they split the pot. Uh, one gets an even $10, the other gets $10 plus one cent. How does the server decide who gets the extra penny? Well, this does happen, and it um, happens in live games as well, and it can be more significant than a penny because it can be an odd chip. Uh, and usually, again, there are no codified rules in poker, usually it just goes whoever's left of the dealer button. So whoever's closest to the dealer button, round to the left, the odd money or the odd chip would usually go to them. Um, so a little bit of technical info for you. Uh, we'll take another one. This is a text from uh, Bis the Hall. Thank you for this, Bis the Tall, in fact. Tall, not Hall. To be fair, more likely that you'd be naming yourself after your height than over your favourite room in a castle, isn't it? Um, what is the expert's opinion on slow playing the nut hand? Um, slow playing, interesting topic and one that people make a lot of mistakes with. Uh, basically, slow playing, for those of you who don't know, means you have a good hand and literally you play it slowly. You don't invest money in it. And the main reason for doing that would be to wait for other players to catch up or to trap other players, to trick them to thinking you have a weak hand. So you might check, they might bet, you might just call, and then you might check again and try and check raise, something like that. Lots of different ways to do it, actually. Um, the fact of the matter is that you should slow play very rarely. Um, and there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, the main reasons are that when you have a good hand, you have an edge, it's a good situation, you want to invest money then. That's when you want to get your money in in poker. You're looking for situations where you have the best of it. So you want to put your money in and you want somebody else to have the second best hand or the third best hand that they'll pay you off with. That's what you're looking for. 
Um, if your opponent doesn't have a hand, it's unlikely you're going to eat chips out of him anyway, so give him the chance to put the chips in. Um, so that's the first reason. The second reason you should really so play is that there are very few hands which, um, like say for example, uh, uh, Bist at all is talking about having the nuts, which is the best possible hand. If you've got the nuts on the flop, um, there are very few hands where when the next card comes down, you're guaranteed to still have the nuts. Uh, so the next card can come down and it will normally make a better hand possible. So uh, the reason you should really slow play is that there will very, very rarely be times when you can't be overtaken. So you don't want to give people the chance to overtake you for nothing. So the sort of default is don't slow play. Having said all of that, of course, there are times when it's right to slow play. Those times are when you have a very strong hand on the board. Kasdan, for example, at the beginning of the show, if you're watching, he had three kings, and the board was king, seven, two, king of clubs, seven spades, two of diamonds. So no flush was possible, no straight was possible. He had the best hand by a million miles. Then it's probably right to let other players catch up a little bit. Another time it might be right is if you're trying to trap someone, particularly if you're trying to trap an aggressive player, so you want him to put his money into the pot, and then you can uh, call and then later on come over the top of him. Um, so there are times where I slow play, but my observation to you would be that people slow play too much, and your best bet usually is to get the money in when you have a good hand. Uh, hope that helps, Bist at all, and everyone else. Keep the text emails coming in. The text is 8422. The email is poke at poke at .co uk. Yes, I'm um, playing in my tournament as we speak. Now, this really is live telly because right now I'm playing in a um, tournament and we're going to be showing it at 12 o'clock as well so I can multitask, you see. Um, so Nick is going to be commentating over everything for the next however long it takes me to stay in the game, which may not be very long. <laughs> well, are you still in now? I'm still in at the moment. Come on, where's the See, positive? See, look, I can play and where's talk because positive... I'm a woman. <laughs> <laughs> right, can we just knock this on the head that men can't multitask? <laughs> yeah, but did. you're good at your surroundings. I'll tell you what, tell you what happened. Somebody did a scientific study that showed that men don't multitask as well as women. And then every woman in Western culture decided that men can't multitask at all. Oh. <laughs> it's nonsense. What do you reckon, women? Um, do you let us know, 84222. Um, now, what we're actually going to do is we're going to take... Um, we're going to have a quick look at one of our little European poker things. You're right. <laughs> I'm thinking about Are you actually hand. breaking down? Uh, guys, we're going to take a little break. We've got a tiny problem with our servers, but uh, we'll get them back up for you. Um, and also, Michelle needs help, don't you? Uh, what, yeah, no, because no, sure we have a special Nick signal. won't help me. Guys <laughs> that I'm playing, guys that I'm playing, I won't let him help We have me. a special signal when she needs help, just this, <laughs> off uh, camera, and then <laughs> we have to take a break. Uh, keep the text and emails coming, and we're going to be back in just a couple of minutes. We'll be back very soon, poker at poker at live .co And UK. if you want to watch some more poker while we do this, you can log on and uh, watch me play. If you're really desperate. Stay with us. <laughs> I'm James Browning, and you're following me on one of my poker tournaments. Guess what? This time we're in Paris. Hi, I'm at the Aviation Club on the Champs Elysees. I'm here for the Paris Open. I'm just about to check in, so I'll see you later at the tables. Uh, we have four international events, so the Paris Open of Poker, the Rendezvous à Paris in July with a World Poker Tour event, uh, the Oldham Series in November, and the Euro Final of Poker in February. Well, the Aviation Club is a special place, a special poker room in, the, in Europe and I guess in the world, because it's it's lavish. It's a very nice place, and oh, you know, you know the what how the. Is it? I don't want to advertise about aviation, but uh, the place is very nice. Paris is a wonderful city, and uh, the place here is especially nice, and and uh, the atmosphere is.
quite comfortable and the best player in the world come here from America and from Europe of course. So. Welcome back. What's my strategy at the Paris Open? Well it's going to be a little bit different this time. Obviously there'll be a lot of players here who I haven't seen before. So early on I'm going to focus extra hard and try and work out their exact style of play. Anyway, that's that out of the way. So let's play some poker. next level is going to be 2550. So we started with a thousand and I've got 1075. Okay, so I've made a profit but uh, I'm still here. The thing is it's important not to really risk your life in these uh, uh, two-day tournaments uh, early on in the tournament. You really should have a good excuse if you've been knocked out early in this tournament. down to 95 players. We've just played two more rounds of 45 minutes and the news about me is slightly better. I've now got 1,750 chips. Remember we started with 1,000. We're going to be going back shortly and the blinds will be 50-100. Anyway, I think they're calling me back so I better get there. We started play at 8 o'clock, it's now 20 past 3. We're going on a 15 minute break. I've had a dreadful session. However, first bit of good news, we're down to 50 players, that's five tables, and I've just drawn a good seat just behind the button. I've only got short chips, but I can tell you what, they're going in this round almost certainly. Well, that's it. I finished 49th. And as I predicted, I did push my chips in on that round. I had King 8 offsuit. And I got called by a pair of fives. A close contest, which the fives unfortunately won comfortably. Not a king or an eight in sight. Anyway, I'm back to London, and I'll be seeing you very shortly on Poker Night Live. Hello again, poor James, that king, poor James. king rubbish, whatever it is, never does get there, does it? Well, I love Bless the sad it. violin music. Yeah, <laughs> like something really bad's happened. Um, <laughs> bless him. He, he must hate that we keep showing that. Um, guys, we're experiencing technical problems. Now, um, this happens reasonably rarely on the show. I'm sure you'll appreciate it. We bring you the show every night uh, live, and um, believe you me, it's, though very boring, very technical uh, procedures to do that for you because we're basically taking live games from the internet, piping them through the TV, and it isn't easy to do. And we do a delay as well because we don't want our players to see each other's cards, do we? Because that wouldn't be very good. I think it'd be entertaining, but no, we don't. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, it is difficult to do, and sometimes the process breaks down. That's what's happened tonight. We are trying to fix it for you. We're going to keep trying for the next uh, 10, 20 minutes. 
If we can't do it, obviously our apologies. Um, think of it as a rained off cricket game. Uh, we will, of course, still show you some uh, poker. Uh, we'll show you uh, some of last night's programme, which won't be as good as Michelle and I, but... And it won't can be get as good as life. watching me play. No, they won't get to watch you play. Go out tomorrow. You're winning at the moment. I know. It's all right, isn't it? I'm winning at the moment. I'm chip leader. Oh, no, I'm not. Gra Graham's just overtaken me. And Buffy would be good to be <laughs> <your> third. <laughs> third out of seven. But I've been playing really well. Well, that's good. <laughs> no one's going to see. Yeah, but it might all go wrong. You, you want to yeah, be, be careful thing. what you wish for. Uh, guys, we have got several of your emails to get through, so we're going to do that while the uh, boffins in the back office try and sort it out. This show's like a beautiful, graceful swan. Here's Michelle and I, serene, in command, lovely to look at. <laughs> it's the ugly duckling story. You're the ugly duckling and I'm the swan. <laughs> I'm doing the swan allegory. Under the water, <laughs> the legs are going like a million... <laughs> Uh, the viewers decide who the ugly duck thing is. Uh, email from Nicholas. <laughs> do you what text? A... 80 you don't Email for Nicholas. Dear Nicholas, that's me, if my mum was calling. Uh, I like to be formal on Wednesdays. Actually, when I do bad things, she says Nicholas like that. Bless Nikolai. Um, I've been having a shocker in multi-table tournaments lately. Uh, card dead nearly all the time. What do you do in this situation? I, do, do you make plays in the most marginal of hands or do you sit and sweat it out? and wait for the dealer to cheer up and do you a favour. I'm getting very frustrated, uh, but that's another story. Uh, with watching players win huge pots with rubbish. Maybe I'm too tight, but who knows. I had a good record in multi-table tournaments. Excuse me, windy pops. Um, and use a pretty tight strategy most of the time. Any of your pearls of wisdom would be most we uh, welcome. That's from Martin, a.k.a. Stanters, or John Keats. I'm second um, now. Michelle's second now, <laughs> for those interested in such developments. <laughs> Uh, not that you're going to see the tournament, so you've long since stopped caring, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> Martin, thanks for the email. Uh, regular contributor to the show. It's nice to hear from you, fella. Uh, Multi-table tournaments and not getting any cards. Look, any, any poker game is going to be difficult if you're not getting the cards. Let's put that one to bed straight away. Um, you don't sit there and sweat it out. You do need to... In multi-table tournaments, um, you do have the pressure. Well, there's twin pressures, really, and they're almost opposing... Uh, one is the pressure of escalating blinds, which chip away at your stack. Um, so that gives the pressure of needing to accumulate chips to withstand the blind increases. And also the fact that the average stack is rising, so your competitors have got bigger stacks than you, which is never great. So you've got one pressure to increase your stack and another pressure to survive, because if you're the last man with chips, you win the tournament. The only way you can go out of a tournament is by going bust. So you've got the pressure for survival and the pressure for accumulating chips. To accumulate chips, you need to put your chips in danger. So those are the twin pressures. Um, if you don't have cards, you can't afford to sit there because of those two pressure. Well, because of the pressure to accumulate chips and the rising blinds, really. Um, I would recommend what, what I uh, what I think the thing to do is not to think about multi-table tournaments in terms of cards because everybody can do that, uh, and everybody will get their fair share of good cards. I understand, Martin, that it's frustrating for you at the moment because you're not getting good cards. But you'll know you've been playing poker long enough. You'll know that it'll come back. At some point, you'll have a run of great cards. Um, you just won't notice it as much because for some reason, human beings notice the bad more than the good. Uh, but you will have that run of good cards. It will balance out. So how do you be a better multi-tournament, multi-table tournament player? Well, it's not about the cards because we all get the same cards. It's about seizing opportunities, in my view. Uh, players that are really good tournament players make chips for themselves. They win pots they have no right to win. And they do that by spotting opportunities. And these opportunities uh, come in lots of different uh, shapes and forms. I have, um, uh, not a journal, but I have a record of moves that I've made that have worked. And um, a lot of pros will have this either written or maybe in their heads. Uh, but as you go through poker, you'll accumulate different moves that work. Things like, for example, the one we saw uh, in our live game a few minutes ago, which was the re-steal from the big blind. You think somebody's stealing from the bun, so you come over the marginal hand, you wouldn't usually play. Uh, and try and take their steal off them. That's a move. You don't need the cards to make that play. Um, moves like, for example, three or four people limp, and it gets to you. You can put in a big raise in that spot, and it's very likely everyone will fold, because if anyone had a good hand, they'd have probably raised with it before. Now, occasionally, you'll run into a big hand that's trapping, but most of the time, you'll collect the dead money. Again, you don't need to have cards for that move. That's a move based on position and betting patterns. Uh, so what I want you to start doing, Martin, and this goes for... Everybody else that's getting into multi-table tournaments but uh, wants to take their game to the next level, obviously the cards are important. You need to play the cards as they come to you. You can't force it too much. 
But think of multi-table tournaments in terms of opportunities. Where can I find an opportunity to make some chips? Where can I win a pot that I've got no right to win? Who's the weak player at the table that I can push around? Whose blinds can I steal? Who's stealing too much that I can re-steal off? And so on and so on and so on. There are loads of opportunities to make chips above and beyond the cards. And good tournament players, the guys that you see in the poker magazines and on TV uh, that win all the time, they have these moves in their memory bank and they know when to use them. And they win pots they've got no right to win. Because if it was all down to the cards, we'd all win the same amount of tournaments, and that isn't what happens. Uh, so I hope that helps Martin, Stanters, Johnny Keats. Uh, keep us updated on your progress. We're going to take another email in a second, but after we've checked in with Michelle. Right, well, I'm currently third. How many players are left, Michelle? Six. How are you feeling? Confidence? Well, blinds are up quite high now. Um, so, what are they? Let me have to, start to move on. I think they're, they're 100 and... Uh, <laughs> 60, 320. Uh-huh. Um, so we're so getting to the point where it's going to kick off, basically, aren't basically, we? Basically, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, I think. Good luck. Um, I think you're currently proving that you can't multitask, actually. <laughs> <laughs> after was, all your, no, after, after was, all your gender-based <laughs> bragging. I was just involved in a hand, which was quite important. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And I was trying to talk to you at the same time, which I can do because I'm doing it right now. Yeah, well, that's because you've made your bet and you're just waiting for the other player. <laughs> that's much less impressive. I was trying to work out the slider because it wouldn't make the thing yeah. go up. Yeah. Oh, look, you've been re-raised. <laughs> oh, no. Sorry, you guys can't see this. It's a bit unfair, isn't it? Uh, another quick email. So I'm just going to call it, I think, because then I can help you. Here we go. We're fine, Michelle. Oh, my head. Yay. Tragic. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if he hits. Yay. Michelle Bust Tragic Trev, that's a live update. Yeah, now I'm chip leader. Ha, oh, that old teacher for going all in with an ace ten. Getting really louder as well. <laughs> Crikey. Uh, email from Jiggery Pokery. Thanks for this, Jiggers, as I'll call you. Uh, do either of you have a great lay down or great read that you're especially proud of? The key word there is lay down, otherwise it's a very different answer. Um, loving your work. I've got lots of reads that I'm proud of. Uh, I think that any time you make a good read where you, you pick up a hand somebody's got based on their betting patterns or uh, based on their physical presence and tells they got something like that, it sticks in the memory because you play good poker when you do that. Um, let's do a good lay down. I can remember a good lay down. I made an online tournament I won a few months ago, which was um, very early on, about the sort of second or th third level of play. And the reason I remember it is because I went on to win the tournament. Um, and it was a hand where I already had a few chips from an earlier uh, hand and I flopped a set, and I think there was, I can't remember exactly the flop, but basically there was a straight draw on the flop, it wasn't even a flush draw, and I made a big bet, and this guy called me, and I knew he was a weak player, because he'd uh, called somebody else down and uh, outdrawn them on the river. Um, so I knew he could well have the set, uh, straight, or something like that. Uh, anyway, the way the betting went, the straight card came, um, he checked, I bet, he raised me. I thought about it for a long time, it would have meant all my chips. I had a set, remember, um, I eventually sh uh, threw it away and he showed me the straight. So that was a lay down I was proud of because it's tough to throw away a set. Um, but it's one I had to make. I felt I had to make. I felt that it was much more likely that he had it than he didn't. Um, and that he wouldn't, because he was a weak player, he wouldn't check raise me. He certainly wouldn't check raise me as a bluff and probably wouldn't check raise me without a very good hand. So I knew that either he had some sort of funny two pair or he'd made the straight. Now, there's a good chance in that situation that sometimes I'll be throwing away a winner when I throw that set away. But my calculation on that occasion was, A, I think it's very likely he's got the straight. I put it about sort of 60-70% chance he had the straight rather than two power or something like that. Um, and B, I would rather fold a losing hand early in a tournament, providing that I'm still competitive with the chips I leave myself, uh, than I would um, take the chance of going out of the tournament. That's my personal philosophy early on. Um, again, providing you're remaining competitive if you throw it away. If I had very few chips left, I would have put them in because it's senseless to fold if you're not going to be competitive uh, after the fold. Um, so that's a lay down Yay. that I'm proud of. You're in the money. Sorry. Michelle's in the money. I'm in the money and I'm chip leader. Get in. If you win again, you're going to want, to, you're going to want me to come round whenever you play. I've got 4,000 chips. The next guy's got 2,600 and the next guy's got 900. Basically what we're trying to achieve now is poker on the radio. That's it's basically what we're doing. Poker radio, because <laughs> we might not be able to watch these. How's it going for you guys? <laughs> I mean, Michelle's giving it, you, you know, you're, you're living it. They're getting all the emotions, <laughs> aren't they? Bless yeah, them. they keep saying that I'm going to, I will do my victory dance if I win. <laughs> 
Uh, we'll look forward to that. Yeah, I need a pug face. <laughs> That's just scary. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit weird. Can you concentrate? Because you need to win now. What happened there? It's all oh. very well getting to the money. Got to close the, the deal. The just gone up hugely or something. Shell, they can't see the they can't see the <laughs> screen, love. Seriously. Oh, Graham's all in. <laughs> this is an email from Dirty Papa, remembering where we are. Uh, Dirty Papa, good name. Hence your selection. Uh, heads up, play. The blinds are pretty even. I usually end up pushing in with a coin toss chance of winning. How can I get an edge on my heads up play? It's a very good question. Um, heads up play, for those of you that don't know, is when two people are playing each other. There's just two people involved in the game. And it uh, happens at the end of a tournament, of course, but there are also heads up matches. And the first thing I'd say, Dirty Papa, is go and play in some heads up matches online. Uh, you can play for any stakes, you can play for play money or tiny stakes, just to practice your heads up game, just to get the feel of it. Um, what you're describing is basically a strategy where you push in and you end up with a 50-50 hand. I so say you've got a pair and they've got two overcards or something like that. It's not really, and obviously this is why you've emailed, that's not really good enough, is it? Because you're really leaving things to chance. And if you've worked hard, even if it's in a single table tournament, but particularly in a big tournament, if you've worked hard to get down to the heads up, um, you, want to do, you want something more than um, a coin toss to decide whether you're first or second. Because bear in mind, guys, the biggest Yay! prize money difference is between first and second. Um, speaking of heads up, Michelle just got to the heads up. I'm so, heads up and I'm tip leader. So what you could do, Michelle, is listen. Yes, I'm listening. Listen. And you get tips. Okay, all about heads then. up. Um, what you want to do is play the man, not the cards. And by that I mean watch for your opponent's betting patterns. Um, because I would say 80, 85% of players fall into predictable betting patterns. And I hope you don't take offence at this. I suspect you do, judging from your email. Um, so your opponent can pick up when you push in and when you don't push in, for example. You can do this to other people and you're looking for weaknesses. So do they always bet smaller when they've got a big hand and bigger when they've got a small hand? What are the hands that they push all in with? Um, if the blinds are small enough, I do do this in heads up matches. I will call with hands that I wouldn't normally call with at the river just to see what cards my opponent's playing. And I'll happily do that one or two times. I don't mind going behind early in a heads up match. I'd rather not, but I don't mind doing it because I want to get a read on his play. When I sit down the heads up game, my first mission is to get a read on my opponent's play and to start to pick up on his tendencies. Now, if you've been playing with him at a table rather than a heads up match, a single table or multi table tournament, um, then you should already have some intelligence about what kind of person he is, what kind of player he is. Um, so you can bring that to bear. But bear in mind that sometimes people change the way they play when they're heads up. So watch closely, try and judge his mood, and try and find a way to exploit him. The beautiful thing about poker, and particularly heads up play, is that there is no strategy that an opponent can employ um, that there isn't a counter strategy for. Uh, and I think that's what makes it such an excellent game. Stupid heads up. There is no foolproof strategy, as Michelle's just found out. I didn't have any cards. Oh, shouty again. I had nothing. Just, you, you've got a mic. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> People I at home are still there. watching. My best hand was 7 4 or something stupid. Well, like I was that. just explaining to the viewers how you have to be able to play without the cards. You know, someone just said, play the man, not the cards. I went all in and he called me and I lost. <laughs> no, to, to, be fair, to be fair to you, at the end of one of those uh, single table tournaments, there's not too much skill in the heads up. There's a little bit, but not too much because the blinds are so big. I come second. Well done. Are you pleased? Yeah, I played well. I really did. If you could watch it, you'd see how well I played. <laughs> but you won't ever. <laughs> uh, can I, can I well do... done to everybody, by the way, um, in that. Good game. <laughs> good game. You had some good cards. I did have really good cards at the beginning. Which Kings, is nice, queens, isn't it? Yeah. We're just doing some emails, me and the viewers. Are you? Join it's us. It's been fun. Yeah, it's been great. Excellent. Um, as I was explaining about 15 minutes ago, we've got some technical problems at the minute, guys. We're trying to fix them. We'll know in the next few minutes whether we're going to have any live poker for you. It is like being on a sports show. It is. The umpires are inspecting in four minutes. Are you doing okay, though, and reading? What, reading? <laughs> Just about, just about struggling through, yeah, with the reading. <laughs> Would you like an email? Um, the last one we did was, do you have a, one of the last ones we did was, do you have a lay down mm -hmm. or a read that you're particularly proud of in your young poker career, Michelle? Have you ever thrown away any cards and thought, well done? I yeah, somebody showed me once as well, and uh, because it was in, 
Um, it was in, I think it was in one of the uh, multi tables actually not so long ago. And because I'm learning, he knew I was learning. He showed what he had, and he did have a really good hand. And he'd been slow playing it, and I felt that he had for some reason. He just he, che he checked twice. And I checked, and I even raised the slider bar up, ready to go in, ready yeah. to re-raise him, because it really looked like it was a stealing bet as well um, on, the, on the river. So I was about to re-raise him, and then folded, and then it turned out he, he did have the nuts. So that felt good. Yeah. And it was nice for him to show me as well, because I would have been... Mm. It should feel good. It should feel as good as anything else in poker, because you've saved money, and um, you know, you've probably done something that most of other players in your spot wouldn't have done. Mm. Um, so yeah, it should feel good, and you know, winning money should feel, saving money should feel just as good as winning money, because on your balance sheet, it's the same difference. Yeah. Here's a, another email. We've been talking about uh, how to play multi-table tournaments. Another email on the subject from Bart Prox Roast. Uh, good evening. First off, I really adore your show. Keep it up. We will try. To be honest, certain things beyond our control. <laughs> are meaning that we can't tonight. <coughs> I'm experiencing some difficulties in poker at the moment. The doctor is in. Bart. Oh, Dr. Tom, is he here? I was referring to the doctor and the nurse. I'm a temporary doctor. Seeing goes and multi-table tournaments are my grounds. I've been quite successful for two months, but now I'm in a downturn. I'm losing game after game. The thing is, I evaluated what's going wrong. It seems to be not showing any aggressiveness or taking risks anymore because I fear to lose another game. So I'm playing really, really tight, causing me to be all in with a mediocre hand because the blind and anties are forcing me to. What should I do? Uh, thanks in advance for your advice. Well, it's a pleasure, but um, if you're playing scared, it's very, very difficult to win at poker because, um, well, it's a confidence game, but it's also a game of aggressiveness. You've got to be prepared to put your chips in. You've got to be prepared to ask the question of the other man. If you start playing passively as you're doing, I mean, obviously you already know this because you've emailed with this content, so you know what the problem is. Um, so the key is to understand that problem and just be bolder with your play. Take on board what I was saying uh, to the last emailer about seeing multi-table tournaments as opportunities and finding opportunities, and don't get so wedded to your cards. And this is a dangerous thing to say to beginners, because obviously playing the right cards and being selective is very, very important. But in a multi-table tournament, that alone will not get you far enough. You've also got to look for opportunities. How have you you've been playing multi-table tournaments the yeah. last couple of months? Mm -hmm. How have you been finding uh do you just wait for cards, or do you sometimes no, try I've and become, steal cards? No, I've, I've been try, I've been really mixing it up lately because I knew I had to mix my game up. I wasn't playing very well. I was playing a really tight game, which isn't working multi-table tournaments. So recently, I've been trying experimenting with a lot more hands, limping in with lesser hands, and hitting really big, mm -hmm. you know, big hands and being able to take more money out and being more aggressive and being careful of, of maniacs as well. Yeah. And uh, being prepared if I'm doing it in early position that somebody could re-raise me and, and even go all in. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, I will um, quickly say to everyone as well, we obviously, Nick, you've done brilliantly obviously over the last uh, 20 minutes. Thank you very much for that. Um, unfortunately, we won't be able to see Thanks. the tournament I come second in. Can we we not are see it? having problems. Oh. No, we can't see it. But I did come second. I played wonderfully, as long as you know that. <laughs> of, course, of course, if you're on Watch Online, you have no way of corroborating this. It is true. Um, what we're going to do, though, guys, is um, from Nick and I, is, is going to be the end of the night now. Um, is it? Which is a shame. Maybe we'll go for a drink. That's oh, a bit late. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to rerun um, some of James and Mark's show from yesterday. Now, for those of you that have been on the forum, you'll see that it was, uh, it was a very good show. There was a good bit of banter between the two of them. It is going to be the Fight Club show from now on. Um, so do watch. We're going to watch, we're going to show like, some of that. Who, who would win in a fight, isn't it? It's like, who's the least wimpy? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, we, are, we are handing over to James and Mark, which is a shame. It is a shame. We we're just be getting back. into it. We were back, actually, we, we're back um, later this month, aren't we, I think? Yeah, I think I'm we are sure again, we are. so don't worry. Um, but guys, uh, thank you for staying with us for the first, uh, for the first half of the show. Enjoy James and Mark. Um, Nick and I, it is good night and goodbye, and we'll see you again later on in the month. We will do. Thanks for all the emails, guys, and uh, make sure you watch tomorrow night at 10 o'clock. Goodbye. <laughs>